Good evening, everybody. My name is Suzanne Leal, and on behalf of the Geelong Regional Library Corporation, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's event with the best-selling, much-loved author, Fiona McIntosh. The Geelong Regional Library Corporation acknowledges the Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma original owners of the lands on which our library services operate. We pay our respects to Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge and celebrate the First Nations peoples of this land as the custodians of learning, literacy, knowledge and story. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us tonight. Apparently, there's going to be about 90 of you, which is a wonderful show up. Before we start, just a little bit of housekeeping. You can participate in this live webinar by clicking on the Q&A button and typing your question or comment. You may need to touch your screen first to see the Q&A function, and that will pop up, particularly if you're using an iPad or iPhone. We'll have time for questions towards the end of the event, so please have them ready, um, put them in the Q&A, and we'll get them to them. This webinar, as you have seen, is being recorded. If you'd like to watch the discussion again or recommend it to friends and family, it will be uploaded to the library's YouTube channel in a few days' time. As I've mentioned, my name is Suzanne Leal. I'm the author of novels The Teacher's Secret, Border Street, and most recently The Deceptions, which won the Nib People's Choice Prize and was shortlisted for the Davit Awards. I co-present the Bad All About Crime podcast, and I'm the online host of Thursday Book Club. Tonight, I'm so very pleased to be here in conversation with Fiona McIntosh. Fiona is one of Australia's favourite storytellers, and her books are regularly shortlisted for the best general fiction category in the Australian Book Industry Awards. Fiona, as you'll know, is a prolific writer, and her novels are published and enjoyed all over the world. Her historical novels in particular have gained her a wide readership. And tonight, we're going to be discussing Fiona's latest book, This Beauty, the Spy's Wife. Welcome to you, Fiona. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. Hello to everyone in Geelong. Um, apologies, I'm not there in person. I so wanted to get back to the library, but we'll do it next year, I promise. But in the meantime, through the magic of this technology and Suzanne here to keep us on track, we will have a lovely evening. Thank you all. And where are you coming to us from at the moment, Fiona? Uh, well, I live in South Australia, but on a farm which is way out in the mid-north and it's uh, currently raining. So um, I think we're getting Perth's weather at the moment, but uh, I'm hoping that won't interfere um, with our broadcast tonight. You're coming over loud and clear, so I think we're, um, I think we're on a roll. Great, great. Fiona, yeah, can I say what a terrific read The Spy's Wife is? I just want to set the scene out before I open to you. The book opens in Berlin in 1933, where we meet Max, who is both German and English. Can you tell me a little bit more about Max? Well, Max was, um, he's sort of a, a man who's torn between two countries. He's really spent a lot of his life in Germany and lives as a German and is quite impressed with what is happening within Germany but his heart a bit like me is sort of um, where you were born where you were raised um, that's he was born and raised in England so he's quite he's patriotic he's very loyal to Britain and so this man finds himself straddling two worlds especially now he's he uh, well I, I won't say what I was about to say because that would give something away but yes I mean he's torn between these two worlds, but at the, at the point that we meet him, he's a German um, and a little bit concerned about the rise of Hitler. And it's 1933 when Hitler is just becoming chancellor. That's right. So 1933, things are really starting to hot up. And in the prologue where we're introduced to Max, he's on his way home when a fire erupts. What is this fire? What's happened? This is the most famous fire in Germany. It's called the burning of the Reichstag. And this was parliament. Um, and it was very symbolic to burn down the parliament house because um, Berlin at the time, in the early 30s, certainly the late 20s, was probably the most liberal place 
in the on the planet you know it was where all the creatives went all the misfits went all the quirky people found their way to berlin um and they were welcome so theater and music and art um you know it was all happening in berlin and then suddenly with the arrival of the nazi ideology um all that liberal mindedness was closed down and it became very much a conservative uh, seat of power. And so the burning of the Reichstag was really burning down that liberal way, the past way. Um, and, you know, it, it was it accepted that, in fact, the Nazis had organized the burning of the Reichstag, even though somebody else was blamed for it. They blamed the communists. So it's a frightening start to this um, book full of intrigue. And then as soon as we've met Mac Max, we are uh, taken elsewhere, you take us to Yorkshire, where we meet Evie Armstrong, who's a young widow. Now, she's very young and she's been widowed. What happened that she was widowed so young? Well, Evie has grown up uh, literally on this railway platform. She's known nothing else but this branch line that her father uh, runs for the railways. Um, it's a real sleepy hollow, but she loves it. And she's grown up there and very happy there. She meets um, somebody from the railways and she marries this fellow and there's an accident very early on in their marriage and she loses him. I don't want to give away too much. So suddenly she's a widow um, and all she can do is commit herself more to her work on this sleepy little branch line that goes out to, um, you know, the it's sort of off the main track and anyone who's watched Heartland will remember a place called Gothland. That's where this uh, railway line goes. It's very uh, quiet. And the only people who are coming there are really um, uh, holiday makers going to the beach, to Scarborough or Whitby um, and going the other way, it's more cargo. So, you know, she's, she's leading a very sheltered life, but she likes it that way. And uh, this is the young woman that we meet, sheltered, closeted, widowed, quiet, um, and suddenly the story explodes, doesn't it? Um, and the without... story explodes, of course. I don't think I'm giving anything away here. When Evie and Max meet, and they meet and they fall in love almost immediately in Yorkshire, and that's how the book unfolds. You often return to World War II in your writing, but this time, however, you've taken us to the pre-war period, not only in England, but also in Germany. Why did you move your focus from the war to this, to this perhaps less exciting or at least less traumatic time pre-war? Well, let me tell you, it was exciting and we'll come back to that, but it was a very deliberate move not to move us into the war years. Firstly, um, the last book I wrote was called The Champagne War and it was really knee deep in the trenches in um, sort of 1915 onwards. And it was a very sad, heart wrenching story. Um, and so I didn't really feel like doing that again so fast, but more to the point, when I was researching The Spy's Wife, it was March 2020 when I was in Berlin and Munich and Stuttgart and Nuremberg, and there was this um, pandemic that was being spoken about. Well, it was just called a virus at that stage coming out of China, but it had hit Italy of all places and Milan was shutting down. We were in um, you know, Germany thinking, gosh, this is feeling a bit serious, isn't it? And so I decided, I think we should go home. And I would gathered up quite a bit of material and we made a dash for the airport and we, and we got home and just in time, March 2020, before Australia locked down and the world locked down. But really what it told me is that we were, when I started writing the book, we were in a very bleak time for the world. And it was a very conscious decision that we did not need a war story. And so I deliberately set it back into the middle of the 1930s when there's actually optimism. We've finished with the Great War. We've finished with the Spanish flu and the Great Depression. And the whole world is emerging into the 30s feeling very optimistic. And that goes for Germany, feeling very suddenly not powerful yet, but beginning to believe in themselves again after being the beggars of Europe for what they did in the First World War. Um, and so it was a very deliberate move. And I also chose to set it 
in summer, which I never do. I always write about winter. Um, I wanted everybody in summer frocks and going for picnics and eating ice cream so that it felt lighter for the reader, but against this rather dark backdrop that only the reader knows that war is actually coming again because the cast doesn't know that war is coming. The, the people in Whitehall are beginning to feel nervous about Hitler, but he hasn't declared himself, certainly not. By 1936, all he's doing is sort of uh, rattling a sabre. Um, and so that's really what this whole story hinges upon. Um, you know, is there more? Is Hitler planning more? It's interesting that you say that you were in Nuremberg, you're in Berlin in March 2020, and then when you realised that this virus was becoming serious, you pivoted and you changed what you were writing about. Does that mean that you went um, to research something in particular and changed, or you went to find a story you didn't yet have? I went to find the story. Um, I never plan anything. I, my poor publishers, I mean, I tell them it's about this very loosely. I could tell them within 10 seconds, it's about a girl and it's going to be a fish out of water story and it's going to be set you know in britain and germany and that's about all they get and they they think okay well fiona we trust you you've written so many books off you go so i never have a real plan for my stories and i a i can't plan i'm not very good at it but b i i like the freedom of uh, and also the dangerous feeling of going in search of a story and hoping it will find me. It always does. But, um, you know, somebody made a quip about me dashing back because we, we really did just get home in time. They said, did that influence the story? Was it that sort of chase in the story that you, you know, because the story itself is sort of high adrenaline and they wondered if that fueled it. Uh, I wasn't aware of it, but no, I, I didn't change the story based on that happening. I actually um, went there to, to go and get this story and I wasn't sure what it was going to be. And, and where were you when it found you? Um, the, the actual story, I was in um, Munich. Munich is when the story really found me. I'd already done a lot of reading about Hitler and the rise of the Nazis, because I think the question on everybody's lips, um, certainly mine, even growing up as a teenager and studying World War II is, how, how did this happen? How was this allowed to happen? Because it was four years of just um, trauma for the, for the world, but one man set this in motion. Um, and I wanted to know what was the political landscape that allowed this? What was, how did this fabulous people, this German people, allow this funny little man, this very ordinary fellow, um, how did they allow him to sort of seduce them, seduce them in the way that he did? So I'd read a lot about Hitler and uh, the ideology. And then I thought, well, I need to now go to these places and see what the story is going to be that shapes around all that knowledge. And it found me in Munich when I realized that this was his playground. Munich was where he went to socialize. Munich was where he took off his uniform, stopped shouting and went very quiet and would meet friends and go to places for tea and coffee. And I thought, I, I quite like that ordinariness about him. And so I want to actually move into that area with him. So I needed my spy um, to come into Munich. And that's when I decided Munich would be where all the focus would be in that beautiful Bavarian landscape. Mm. Oh, that's fascinating. That's um, when you move into the area of spying, what's really interesting is the spying tools. So, like, and again, tell me if I'm giving anything away. I don't think I am. I mean, it is called the spy's wife. There is a, there is a spy involved and spies need tools. And you describe a series of spying tools, which include a penny and a tiny camera. Can you tell me a bit more about these spying tools and how you I've found seen, them? I've seen these items. It's incredible. I went to the spy museum in, um, in Germany and spent a lot of time just wandering through and realizing that spy craft is as old as prostitution. You know, it goes back to the ancient Greeks and probably further still, where the carrying of clandestine information was vital, vital to um, 
anyone who is in power um, and for the control of other people. And so, you know, we tend to know more about the Cold War when predatory went a little bit more tech, but there's been all sorts used up until then. And I, I love that in the 1930s, there was the arrival of the subminiature camera, um, really tiny camera where they'd go click, 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 click like this. And I thought, oh yes, I have to use that in the story. Um, but there was this copper penny that I saw, which had been sharpened and a little blade could be lifted out of this penny. And I thought, oh, what are you sad? And then there was this scarf. Um, and when you tied up the scarf, it, it looked beautiful, just looked really pretty. But when you untied it, there was a map. And so spies used it to navigate around uh, Germany to know where they were going. And I thought, I've got to use that. But I used my scarf in a completely different way. I didn't want to steal the idea completely. So um, that's why the Hermes scarf has become um, such a strong motif in the whole story and why we've got a competition to win an Hermes scarf at the end of this. So the scarf's really important. Um, and there were playing cards. I really love the playing cards um, that you could peel them back and there were all sorts of messages written in those playing cards. Fabulous, invisible ink. It was all raging in the 30s. And I was so excited to see all this. And I, I, I wanted to throw the kitchen sink at it. I wanted to use everything, but I had to temper myself or she'd have been a bit too much like James Bond with all these gadgets. But, um, and, the, and the real idea of this was I wanted to blur the lines with the spies. So there are actually two spies going on. There's a spy, a German spy in Britain, and there's a British spy in Germany. And I really wanted to blur those lines a little bit so that the reader was unsure, where is the treachery going to come in? Because you can feel treachery building somewhere uh, through the story. And you think, who's going to be at the root of this treachery? Um, so I loved playing with the reader's emotions um, with, the, with the two spies. What I um, really like about this book, too, is that you've got a series of fictional characters. It's, after all, a novel. You've got yeah. AP and you've got Max. And then, lo and behold, there's some real-life figures as well. Yeah. Most interestingly for me, a man called Ferry Portia. Tell me about Ferry. Okay. Well, I was astonished when I was researching to find out that the, the Portia family were very much involved with the Nazis. Now, I'm not saying they were necessarily subscribing to the ideology, um, but they were benefiting hugely, I mean, massively from the support of the Nazis. And Hitler um, loved cars. He couldn't help himself. He loved cars. So he was always at racing tracks. He was very interested in racing engines, but he was very interested in engines and how he could adapt maybe a racing car engine to a jet fighter. Um, and so he was very involved with the original Ferdinand Porsche, but I decided to leave the old man alone and work with the son who was also Ferdinand, but called Ferry. And he seemed like quite a playboy kind of a figure, quite a nice man when you read about him. And I was nervous about using a real person, but I tried not to paint him as a, um, as a villain, but certainly someone who unwittingly, so he, he knew he was benefiting from this very powerful man who was um, really turning the country a different way. And he was turning a blind eye. I think all the Nazis were turning a blind eye anyway. So he was very interesting to play with and I decided I would bring his family into it and his children. Um, and it creates a, a really tight and tense scene um, when Evie and Max meet these people. I mean, I didn't know what was going to happen um, was going to happen. And it suddenly did become a bit like a James Bond story when we get to that point. I don't want to spoil anything, but it's very tense when we're in the Porsche household. It's a terrific scene. And, and like you said, it was fascinating to think that this family, this, this car family, the Porsches were so intricately involved, even perhaps, as you say, simply turning a blind eye. Yeah. Um, You've also said that you, you were a little bit nervous about introducing him. Does that mean that you don't normally introduce real people into your novels or is that something that you frequently do? 
No, I do use real people, but usually people that, um, apart from someone like Hitler, that people don't know that well. You know, they're, they're people who are mentioned in history regularly. But Ferry Porsche isn't mentioned in everyday conversation. And so I thought, well, you know, this is a car company that we all know, we love. It's a bit like Hugo Boss suits. We all love the Hugo Boss brand. And then we find out that he was the guy who designed the the stormtrooper uniforms, you know, for the Nazis. And all these German companies were getting very rich on Nazi um, uh, projects. And so particularly the Porsche, the Porsche family were given the Volkswagen deal. I mean, it was known as the people's car. Volkswagen means people's car. And Hitler wanted every single family in Germany to have their own car. Why? Because he was jealous that people in Britain and America and even Italy, I mean, Italy had more cars per capita than uh, the Germans. And he couldn't stand that. So he decided he was going to in put in this project in place to give every family um, a car and they had to invest, um, I think it, however many Reichsmarks it was and they had to pay it off slowly. But what he was doing was taking that money that they were paying to get their car and using it to, to rearm the country. So it was all very, and Porsche had the contract to build these Volkswagens. So it's all very insidious, really, how it all held together. But I couldn't leave it alone. It was too interesting. And I do like in my books to have, I like to surprise people that maybe as they're reading, they pick up a little tidbit from history that perhaps they didn't know. So if it's delighted me to find something out, I think, well, I'm going to put that in the story. Um, I'm not trying to give you a history lesson. If it can just give you a little ping of pleasure to think, gosh, I didn't know that, um, then I've achieved something, I think. I must say, for me, when I read the book and I read about Ferry and, and Ferdinand, the father, Portia, I went straight to the internet and thought, is that? Is that right? <laughs> Is that true? And, and, and sure enough, it absolutely was. Yeah, yeah. Well, sorry. No, good. It's intriguing. It's lovely. And that's to enrich through fiction is wonderful, isn't it? To actually be able to think that, well, this is a story and I'm loving the story and the escape of it, but I'm actually taking something on board that I didn't know before. Um, I think that's a wonderful um, part of writing good fiction. And that leads me to my next question. You're a historical novelist, amongst many other things. Well, how do you balance the need to tell a story and to impart historical information? How do you find that balance? Yeah, I, the thing is, I never set out to, um, I'm never trying to give you a history lesson. I, that's not my role. My role number one is to deliver to the reader a fabulous story that they can't put down. They're gonna just keep turning the pages. I think my job with the historical side of it is to build the world around the reader. So they feel like they're toppling into this world and it feels so real. So all the textures and the, the sounds and the tastes and the fashion and the transport and the music and the, the way people are speaking and the way they're going about their lives, it all feels yeah, I, resonant of everything else they might know about the era or they've read in other books or they've seen on television. I'm just pinging all the original knowledge that they have but beginning to build this world and create a sort of a, a lovely bubble around them so that they feel they're in this world and they trust me. And then if I can actually layer in some really interesting little bits like the Porsche family or like Hitler's favourite cafe was the Carlton Tea Rooms. And I remember when I was talking to my publisher, I was saying, I'd love to bring him into the story, but I don't want him to be a caricature. I don't want him to be this shouting... Um, you know, little man on a big stage in his uniform with swastikas all around him. And I said, I just want him to be, actually be in civvies. And she said, I dare you to do it. I dare you to, and you bring him, to bring him into contact with Evie. And I thought, I'll take that dare. And so I was writing this scene thinking, can I pull this off? Can I just have this almost, you know, they could have missed each other but they, there's just this fleeting glimpse. And it's quite chilling, that scene, that it is him and she's a spy and thinking, my gosh, it's you, you know, and trying not to show it 
on her face. And so I loved writing that scene. That's probably my favourite scene of the whole book. I think the fairy Portia scene is the most my favourite. We, we spoke earlier about your research and you were telling us that you were in Germany as the pandemic struck. So that means that from March 2020, you were no longer in Germany and you were no longer free to travel the world as often you do with your books. Um, what did that mean for the research and for the development of the book? Yeah, it was it was hideous. I mean, it was for someone like me that um, I write in layers. So I like to get the first draft written and, you know, just so that I know the arc of the story. And that is based on sort of the first gathering of all the material that I do. Um, and I will usually go back to my locations because I refuse to write a book unless I've been to every location in the story that I'm using. Um, and I don't mean from memory. So the fact that I might go to Paris for The Pearl Thief is not good enough if I'm going to write Paris for The Spy's Wife. I have to go to Paris for The Spy's Wife. Now, I know the audience is saying, oh, that's a really clever way to travel, isn't it? But um, if you're in the right frame of mind, I went there for The Spy's Wife and you've got a whole different sort of lens on than when I was writing for another book. And so... Um, I wasn't able to get back and do that two second or third visit. The Champagne War took me four visits to Epinay to get right. And I would have liked to have certainly got back to Germany uh, at least once more, but I couldn't. Um, and so I had to come to terms with that. Luckily, I'd done Yorkshire. I'd done already done everything I needed in Yorkshire. Plus, I have a very good friend who's a his, historical specialist and archivist who lives in Yorkshire and she can get to anywhere for me and look things up. So I sent out an SOS, um, you know, out into the world and I thought, I hope somebody reads this. And right enough, this lovely little gang of historians in Munich of all places said, look, we normally sell our services to the world because the world is very interested in Munich and Hitler and, you know, the Nuremberg rallies and all this sort of thing. And they said, we can see you're trapped. We can see what you're trying to do. Use us and let it be a gift from us to you. And so they just opened up their, their hearts and their emails and said, you know, pepper us with all your questions. And I, they were really random. I was telling somebody um, yesterday, I think, where I said I needed to know what a jail cell looked like in a particular precinct of Munich in 1936, but in July. And they found that and were able to tell me what color the walls were painted, what was on the floor, you know, where people were kept before they were taken for interrogation and what that interrogation room looked like. It was incredible what they did for me. And they just did that to be generous, you know? So um, the pandemic has brought out maybe the warts of people, but also the generosity of spirit in people, I think. And, and I couldn't have done it without them. They were fantastic. Diana, you're a writer of many types of books, many genres, if you want to use that word, including fantasy, crime and historical fiction. But to date, you're best known for your historical fiction. How do you explain that? Why do you think that's the, um, the books that have most found your audience or your largest audience? I think it's because it was what I always wanted to write. I always wanted to write historical fiction. But when I began writing, um, I was mentored by the maestro, Bryce Courtney. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, look, you are a writer. You haven't written a book yet. You're going to fly, but you're not going to fly with historical from the get go because it demands its pound of flesh. You're not ready. And when you're ready, you will write historical fiction. So go home and write what you know. And that sort of advice is very vague. And I thought, well, when am I going to know I'm ready? Um, but he was so right. I went home and I, what I'd been devouring whilst my children were growing up um, was fantasy. I was reading all the best fantasy in the world. And so I decided, well, I'll write, I'll write a fantasy. And I wrote it very quickly because I knew what I wanted to read. I knew what the characters needed to be like. I knew what the plot needed to be like. And of course, all of this is um, making sense in my mind now that that is what Bryce meant, write what you know. I knew what the audience for fantasy wanted. And so I wrote a book and I wrote it very quickly in about 
gosh, it was like six or seven weeks, sent it off to the biggest publisher in the world. And they said, can we have three of these? Can you write a trilogy? So I went from wannabe to, you know, fairy tale. Um, I was a, an author overnight and it was, he was so right. And I wrote fantasy for 10 years. You know, I wrote 14 massive books that went worldwide, translated into 12 languages. And then I began to feel, all right, I've done my very public apprenticeship. I know how to write a good story now. I know how to bring it all together. I know how to juggle a big cast. I know how to go and find the information I need. And that's when I felt ready. And I was ready because, you know, I was able to just launch into historical fiction and I wasn't scared of it. It didn't, it didn't phase me. And I was able to do the kind of monster research it takes. It takes two years to, from the moment that I decide, okay, that's the book I'm gonna write. Um, you know, it takes two years from when I sit down to start reading about it. So um, it's, a, it's a big undertaking. And so, you know, I think that's what he meant. It's gonna demand its pound of flesh. You're not gonna make any money for a while until you, you know, you've just got to get books out and get known as an author. When you say that um, it takes two years from woe to go for a historical novel, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to, to fit that into your schedule because you seem to publish two books a year. So how does that work? How does the maths work? Well, I'm very good, like all women, at compartmentalising. And so I've always got three books on the go and I'm not necessarily, I'm very rarely, never until recently, writing two books at once. So I'm always writing one, editing another, researching a third. So right now I'm working on um, the second draft of my book for next year. I've already delivered it to my editor. She loves it. We've done the sort of structural thoughts of what needs to be done. And so I'm working on that new uh, version of it. I'm currently researching the 2023 historical novel and I'm gearing up to start writing any minute the new Jack Hawksworth novel. So that's, you know, I'm a happy hamster in my wheel and I've always got three books uh, spinning around and, and actually physically working on them in some shape or form. It makes my head spin, but I'm actually very glad that you've mentioned Jack Hawksworth because I've just finished, in fact, listening to Mirror Man. Oh, great. Fantastic. Thank I you. Say, it was one of the, um, I, I run in the mornings and I couldn't wait to get out. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I love that. I love that. Thank you. It's he's, a, a, he's a lovely character. I, you know, I wrote Jack 10 years ago. Um, the reason I wrote crime, apart from loving crime, crime's what I choose to read when I read fiction. Um, I was writing fantasy too fast for my publisher and they said, we've got to slow you down somehow. You're, you know, we can't publish as fast as you are writing these books. So I said, well, what am I to write? I don't know what to do. And they said, oh, no, what do you read? And I said, I write, I read crime. And they said, well, write a crime and we'll publish it. It was just, it was sort of go away. That's what they were saying. Just go away with all these books that you keep sending to us. And so I sat down and I thought, right, I'm going to write this lovely crime and I'm going to build the man of my dreams in it and all this sort of thing. And I wrote this book and they loved it. And they said, oh, we're definitely publishing this, but we want to publish under a pen name, which I thought was a bit um, short-sighted because I'd already, I was already very established with a, quite a big audience around the world with fantasy. And I think people are intelligent enough to think, well, I love her fantasy, but I don't want to read crime or I, or I am interested in crime and I trust this author, so I'm going to read her crime. But they decided to bring me out under a pen name. And of course, it was like debuting again, and it never really got off the ground. So this Jack was sitting in my mind. And 10 years later, my new publishers, Penguin, said, let's bring out your Jack books again, shall we? Shall we, you know, we had the rights back. And they said, let's put new covers on, bring them out as Fiona McIntosh. And we brought them both out. And all my readership just loved, loved them, just went so fast. We were reprinting before we'd even got them out into the shops. Um, and so they said, right, well, we need a third Jack. So I wrote Mirror Man um, quite quickly to, to, and it was lovely to be back in Jack's shoes again. Just, I'd forgotten how much I really adored him. And I find him so easy to write. I was 
worried after a 10 year uh, break that I wouldn't be able to touch the Jack of 2006 and 2007. But honestly, it was like a comfy old pair of jeans. I, I loved it. And so now I'm writing the fourth Jack book because Mirror Man did go very well. It went, it went to number one in Australian fiction, which is, I suppose, um, a measure that we all quite enjoy reading crime, you know, and we devour crime on uh, streaming television. We can't quite get enough of crime. And I'm one of those people. So I'm thrilled. Um, and also it's been optioned for the small screen. So uh, oh. it's just all happening for Jack at the moment. And so I'm really looking forward to writing more books that involve him and, and turning my hand to crime. It's a lovely counterbalance to the historicals. And what interests me particularly about the difference between, for example, the pearl, the, the pearl thief and the spy's wife and then uh, Mirror Man is the style of writing is completely different. The historical yeah. novels are lush, yes. visual, um, very, uh, very velvety. Yes. The um, Hawksworth is quite sparse. Yeah. Uh, the, the sentences are shorter. Um, the rhythm is a much more staccato rhythm. It's, it's almost like two completely different pieces of music. Is that, is that a deliberate thing? No, no, not that I'm aware of, because I would have thought if somebody had said to me, so how do, how do you do that? How do you balance that? I would have thought, well, all the trademarks of my writing exists in, in those books, but it's actually a glorious compliment from you that you can feel a different rhythm, that you can feel a different style of writing, and it's not coming from me. So that is actually testimony to my... Um, uh, creed that I hand over to my characters and I know that sounds a bit arty farty but I do I just expect them to do all the heavy lifting because I don't plan so I need them to actually take the story and take it wherever they need to take it and you're right the historical is more lush it's more elevated in its language it's more um, it moves it should move slower. I think the spy's wife moves quite fast, actually, but it it does move to a slower click. Whereas with uh, Hawksworth, I mean, there's body on the ground from page one, and off we go. You know, we're hunting the serial killer from the get go. So uh, thank you, thank you. That's that's a glorious compliment. What you've said in your book, How to Write Your Blockbuster, is that natural born storytellers can always acquire writing skills. Do you remember that? I what, do. And what, I think, what do you, I think that? you go ahead. Sorry, what, what do you mean by that? Oh, what do I mean by that? I think somebody who is a natural storyteller can then be can then absorb, like, I think I am a natural storyteller. I've discovered this about myself. And if I look back at my life, I realize, because a lot of people say, how did you, because you came to it really late. It was, I was 40 before I got published in fiction and I hadn't been writing books to that point. You heard my story about, I wrote a book and suddenly they wanted three of them. I had never thought to write a book until that moment, but um, I think I'd always been somebody who sat down at the dinner table and would say, I fell over today, I must tell you about it. And it turned into bigger than Ben-Hur. It wasn't just a small story. It was like, you know, huge and it went on for ages and it was entertaining and my whole family had to suffer through it. So I've always been a storyteller. And I know even when I was little, I would be the, the kid in the playground who would invent the story that we were going to act out and we'd have spies and we'd have you know or cowboys and Indians and all this I would work out the story and everybody would scuttle off and play their roles so natural born storytellers like me can learn how to write fiction you know and in my master classes that's what I'm doing I'm actually saying to a lot of natural born storytellers you can do this there are certain beats to commercial fiction. And if you can hit those beats and I'm gonna show you what they are, you know, you can do this story that you want to write. So I think it's a lot tougher if you're not a natural storyteller to come to fiction and think, I don't know where to begin. I don't know, you know, what am I supposed to do? And natural storytellers do tend to be people who read a lot of books anyway. So I, I think, 
that's my take, that people who read from young and acquire a lot of stories in, you know, they understand what the reader wants from a book. You mentioned your masterclasses. Tell me a bit about the masterclasses, what you do and how they started. Well, it came out of my own masterclass when I wanted to write this story, this original story. Um, I, I knew what I wanted to do, but I felt I needed a guide. I needed someone who said, you know, commercial fiction, you need to do this. And, you know, if you do this, uh, you'll get published. I, I figured it was going to be pretty straightforward. So I went to the best. I went to a Bryce Courtney masterclass in Tasmania, spent a week with him, and he changed my life. Um, it, everything he said made such sense to me. Um, and I live by a lot of all those creeds that he set up. Um, I live by them today. And when uh, Bryce was uh, very, very ill, very frail, and in fact was dying, he decided to hold one final masterclass. And he asked me to come over and visit the group and sort of uh, motivate them. And so he could say, look, look what I did with Fiona. You two can do this. Uh, when I got there, he was so sick. And, um, and he said, could you help me run it? You know, so I helped him sort of run the class um, because he was so very frail. And he said, you're a natural kiddo. He said, you've got to keep this going. When I'm gone, I want you to promise me that you will run a masterclass and look over your shoulder and help all the, the new and emerging writers, give them, give them the benefit of what you've learned. And so I, I couldn't deny him his dying wish for me. And so, you know, he died in 2012. And then by 2013, we had a masterclass up and running. And I thought, look, I'll do a couple but they kept filling and they fill, they just fill, fill, fill. There are so many brilliant writers in Australia and all they're looking for, just to answer your question, is more, um, not I, permission's the wrong word. They need somebody who is going to walk into their life at the right moment and say, you can do this and I'm gonna help you and I'm gonna show you behind the scenes, behind the book, of how this works. And so really that's what I'm doing. I'm walking them across the landscape of commercial fiction and, and all the elements that make a great story and that every professional storyteller, the novelist who you find in the top 10, this is what they're doing. This is, this is what they're juggling all the time as they're writing. And I'm trying to um, just equip them with all the right arsenal of uh, weaponry, I suppose, so that they don't fall by the wayside or make any of the mistakes that I, I know are waiting to sort of grab them. If I can help them, I will. And it's, the masterclass is brilliant. We've got about 400 in the, um, in the group now who have passed through the doors of masterclass. We now have our own national conference. We're so big, we have our own NatCon and the publishers come and the retailers come and the, you know, the literary agents come. So it's a great community of writers. Um, and we've got so many up with the majors, you know, so many of the writers that are on the books, bookshelves right now. Um, if you read uh, the acknowledgements, you'll say, you'll see, I was in the masterclass of 2014, or I was in the masterclass of, so we've got quite, we're pretty proud of ourselves, actually, what we've achieved. And will you be having in-person masterclasses next year? Yes, absolutely. Um, we are in fact, uh, we're set up for January. I'm taking the mini masterclass to Hobart. Um, so that's the first time we've left South Australia. Then we'll have the main masterclass, the five day signature in April. And I've been persuaded by the StoryFest team to bring that main masterclass into Queensland. So I'd said never, I will never take the masterclass out of South Australia, but suddenly I'm going to Queensland. So I don't know how it happened. I think they did smoke and mirrors and, um, you know, all chloroformed me and got me to say yes, but we're taking it and it's filling, it's filling fast. So there are lots of brilliant writers out there and what they need more than anything is confidence. They just need the confidence to know anyone can do this. If I can do it, you can do it too. Oh, that's um, that's fascinating. But I've um, I'm mindful that I've been monopolising you. We've got fifteen minutes to go, and we've got a string of questions. So I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, read out some of the questions that have okay. been put in the Q and A function. So this is from Tanya Farrelly. As always, so fascinating, Fiona. 
What do you think is at the heart of our fascination with Germany and Hitler and World War II in particular? Tanya, hello. Now Tanya is a masterclasser, can I tell you? And you will know her book is The Eighth Wonder. Um, well done, Tanya, I'm very proud of you. And yes, um, anything connected with Hitler still fascinates. I mean, it's a known thing in book circles in the industry. If you've got Hitler anywhere on your cover, even mentioned, people will buy that book. It is a relentless interest and I, I can't really explain it to you, but I am interested by him because as I say, how did the world allow this little man who all he ever wanted to be was a watercolor artist, but just wasn't good enough to get into the academy in Munich. If only that Academy of Arts had let him in, we wouldn't have had World War II um, and we certainly wouldn't have had the Holocaust or that hideous Nazi ideology that um, you know, took over the world for a while. Um, I think we're all fascinated by evil. I think that's what it is. Um, we wouldn't watch crime so much. We wouldn't be so consumed by serial killers or um, you know, violence if we weren't vaguely fascinated by uh, evil. I think that's what it is. So long as it's not happening to us, we're actually quite intrigued by it. There's a, there's a uh, question from Donna McEachran, and her question is this. You are, well do, you, you are well known for your research and travel. How have you managed writing without traveling? It's it, I think. hideous. It's Donna, isn't it? It's hideous, Donna. I'm, I really, my wings have been clipped and uh, I, it's really scary because for the 2022 book, I have written an all Australian story. And my editor said, you can do this. It was like she was stroking the head of a child. You can do this, don't panic. Um, I was feeling very unnerved that I had no choice. If I was going to have a book for next year, it had to be based in Australia because I could not get to all my um, far flung places. And I, as I say, I refuse to write a book based on memory or Google, you know, I have to go and put my feet on the ground. And what was even worse, I couldn't even get to Tasmania or Victoria or New South Wales to write my story. We were all in lockdown and I had to write a story from South Australia. So that's what's coming next year. It's called The Orphans. It's written and I'm very, very relieved. Um, relief is like a drug in my body at the moment that uh, my editor has said, I don't know what you're worried about. This is the best book you've written. I love it. So you know, what can I say? I'm, I'm just relieved that she, she's happy with it. And now we spend the next year finessing it and getting it ready for next year. Thanks, Donna. We have a question from Chrissy Mills. And she says, the master classes are fabulous. Well worth it if you're thinking of writing and need a prod. Looking forward to reading The Spy's Wife. So that's a oh, Gorgeous, Chrissy. Hello. <laughs> and now there's a question from Gary Fay. And the question Gary has is this. Having written in a variety of genres, fantasy, crime and historical fiction, do you alter your writing process in any way between genres? No, not at all. Gary is a masterclass, by the way, and a fine writer. Look at them. We're like a virus of our own, aren't we? All of us masterclasses. Uh, Gary, it's a good point you make, but no, I don't change my modus operandi. I write in exactly the same way um, any of my stories. I have a, a, a discipline that I stick to. Um, I am very disciplined with my writing, and it doesn't change no matter what genre I'm writing. The only thing that changes is the type of research that I do. The crime doesn't require as much research as the, um, or all that towers of reading. Because if you're going to set a book in 1936, you need to know everything about 1936. You know, what was the political landscape? What were people, you know, what were people doing in that time frame? So I read a tower of books about that, that era. When I'm writing crime, I just have to make sure if I'm not in a contemporary time, I'm sort of in 2007 at the moment, 2008 with Jack. I just have to get the phones right and the, the music right and the, that sort of thing. But for the most part, no, everything's the same. Donna English has a comment and she says, so excited to read your Australian story. Is, if anyone's thinking of joining Masterclass, do it. <laughs> Another one. Lovely, Donna. Thank you.
And we have another question from Donna McEatron, and she says, uh, we all love Jack. Any news on the casting of the TV show? Oh, look, it's 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 like this, um, I don't know, it's like this frisson that's going on in my body. Who is it going to be? I mean, I was looking at Liam Hemsworth in a movie the other day, and I thought, you look like Jack. You're just not old enough to be Jack. If we could just get Hugh Jackman over the line, I think we'd all take it, wouldn't we? That <laughs> The Jack in the book is just a little bit younger than Hugh Jackman. But when I wrote the story, I wrote it 10 years ago when Hugh Jackman was the perfect age to be um, to be Jack Hawksworth. So I don't know. If you're out there, Hugh, and you're watching, please say yes. But um, no, no news yet, none at all. The first thing that will happen with that will be the writing, the screenplay. And um, I will, they're very, they're brilliant. They sort of want me involved a little bit in the writing side so that they can come to me and say, would Jack do this? Is this okay if we do this with Jack? Um, and I think that's wonderful because I would have anticipated that once they've got it, it's theirs and they'll do what they like with it. But they're being incredibly generous and saying, we'd love to know that you're there and that our writers can chat to you and maybe you can come and have a sort of a brainstorming meeting with us. Um, so that's very exciting. So are you saying that you actually wrote Jack with um, Hugh Jackman in mind? Absolutely. I wrote it for Hugh Jackman. He just didn't know. He was my Jack. Um, but the thing is, uh, he's got older and Jack hasn't. Jack is still in 2007, 2008. So, um, you know, if he could be persuaded, it would be lovely to see Hugh Jackman on the small screen, certainly. Oh, watch this space. Yeah. We have a question from Pamela through Ray Ratham, and her question is this, how do we find out about your masterclasses? Oh God, just, you know, jump online, go to my site, my website, which is fionamackintosh.com, and you can just email me and say, I'm interested, um, can I know more? And I'll, I will answer, I answer all my own email and I will give you everything you need to know. And I'll see you around my table. And a comment from Tanya Farrelly, Masterclass is amazing. And also one from Gary Fay, agree with Tanya, Masterclass is so amazing and inspiring. Uh, another question from Donna English. Fiona, just wondering if all the characters, of all the characters you've written, who is your favourite? Easy, Katerina. Katerina okay. from The Pearl Thief. Um, she is... Uh, the most damaged woman. Um, I've never written such a damaged woman before, and she is so brave uh, the way she has to, because she's been on the run all her life. This is a Holocaust survivor. Um, she's been on the run her whole life um, from one particular man who put, just foisted such horror on her life. And there comes a point in this story where she realizes no more running, I've got to turn around and I'm gonna face him and I'm gonna deal with him. And that takes immense courage. And I loved that she's mine, she's my character. And that, um, you know, she came and tapped me on the shoulder in Prague and said, I'm here, the story's about me. I felt I knew her immediately, I adore her. And I think she's a woman for all women. You know, she's really, um, strong but a bit like Evie in this story Evie's very strong but that that strength is driven by fear for others you know lives are on the line here for Evie and um, everything she does that is brave and incredible is based on her her torment and fear about what would happen if she doesn't and that's how Katerina is um, so yeah, The Pearl Thief is my favourite book. You're not meant to love your children more, but The Pearl Thief's my number one, and The Spy's Wife's my number two, I would say. Kimberly Stolk has this question. Fiona, you regularly make reference to food or beverages in your stories. What is your standout for The Spy's Wife? And then, did Germany have you craving something? I think the, st <laughs> no, the standout for The Spy's Wife for me was the cherry cake that Evie bakes at the beginning of the story because it became part of the plot and it became quite important um, as a motive. The cherries and the cherry blossom and the cherry trees and the cherry cake, it all became very important in the story. So that was the food that really captured me. But in Germany, actually, it was learning about the sausages that they eat and the one where they squeeze it out of 
the skin. I was like, oh, as I was as I was researching it, but I was fascinated by it. And so I decided I would bring that into the story. I love bringing food into a story because I'm a I, I'm not a foodie, but I am a cook. I love to cook. And so food interests me. And I, I it's a bit like you never see people charging their phones in stories. You never see them go to the loo or, you know, actually being tired enough to sleep or, you know, all of this. I, it just never feels quite real. And so I think by bringing food into my stories, I add that layer of realism that people have to eat and they need to drink. And I pause in the story for them to do that. I must say, when you had the Weisforscht uh, scene, which is that the white sausage in, in Bavaria, it was very nostalgic for me. I had a Bavarian boyfriend years oh. ago who, um, who had to teach me how to actually unravel the skin of the sausage. There you go. I mean, it's for, for real. It's for real. And we went to one of those beer halls to make sure that I got the, the beer calicine absolutely right. And it was, uh, you know, it's fun. It's as, It's sort of almost bazo, but it was terrifically fun to be there with, you know, great steins of beer. And um, I loved it. I could see why people would have enjoyed that, you know. Um, so that's what I mean. It's very important to put your feet on the ground. Otherwise, you might get the judgment wrong. Or you, you can't quite touch that atmosphere. And the reader needs that to, because they may never have been in a beer hall before. So you need to build it for them. We've got a couple of comments from Patricia Marola and um, her question, which you answered, had been, um, what's your favourite book? And which you've answered as The Pearl Thief and then The Spy's Wife. And um, Patricia then says, I could listen to you all day. What a wonderful life you lead. You're an inspiration and thank you. Oh, Patricia, thank you. That's lovely. Now we have um, a couple more. I think we've got a couple more minutes. Um, now, this is... Uh, to um from debbie wassell and this might be a question that means something to you more than it does to me fiona how have we gone all this time and not heard about an underwear mishap i know look when i'm on a stage you know i will always bring an underwear mishap story to the stage to sort of finish us off and um make us all laugh but because I've had my more than fair share of wardrobe mishaps that are usually connected with my underwear. And I even have a podcast about it because um, if it's happened to me, it's happened to others and they're beginning to share their horror tales of knickers going wrong. But I haven't been anywhere since, you know, the beginning, well, since I got back from Germany and I haven't had quite the same opportunity for the mishaps that I'm used to having because they usually happen when I'm traveling um, or I'm at a meeting or I'm going somewhere special and I haven't been doing any of that so I'm sorry Debbie that I haven't mentioned my knickers once um, through this but here we are I've said the word knickers three or four times now just for you what Debbie has noted, though, is that you've managed to match your dress with the cover of the book. As, as Thank I, you. Well, Thank I, you. Someone's noticed. I do these subtle things. And I think my husband says, do you think people know you go to that trouble? And I said, there's always one or two people who say she's wearing red lipstick like that girl in the, you know, I used to do things like uh, cut my hair the same way as the as the character, and I've stopped doing that. But thank you, Debbie, for noticing my red frock. It took me a long time to find a plain red dress. Um, they're not busy on the ground, I must say, unless you're sort of 18 years old and very busty and you want to look a bit vampy. Um, to find a plain red dress is quite hard. So thank you for noticing. From um, Patricia Marolo. Um, hi, Fiona. I work in community services aged care and I have a client who adores you. When I speak to her, she always recommends your book. If possible, would you send her a personal me message just to say hello? It would make her day. Um, okay. And, 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 and there's an a email address. So her name is Kasuma. She loves you and your writing and your message would be a gift to Kasuma. Thank you, Patricia. Um, I'll, 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 say, I'll pass that on to you, um, Fiona, afterwards. Uh, given this is going being recorded, is there a special message you'd like to say just on screen now to Kasuma? Kasuma, if you're listening to me, I'm sending you my love and best wishes. Keep reading and I promise I'll keep writing books just for you. But I will send you an email message, I promise. 
And um, Debbie Wassell says, and in my opinion, The Pearl Thief is your best writing to date. It was next level. I loved The Pearl Thief too. Yeah. And um, from Elizabeth Walton, great session as always, Suzanne and team, well done. Very informative and interesting. Thank you. And um, from Patricia, thank you, you're gorgeous. <laughs> and uh, look, I, I think on that note, we've um, come to the end of the session. I'd like to thank you, uh, Fiona, for such a great discussion. So vivacious, so interested, so encouraging. It's, uh, it's been a delight. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And of course, The Spy's Wife is available to borrow from Geelong Regional Libraries. You can also purchase a copy of the book from our bookseller, Cook and Young Booksellers via their website. That's a Geelong bookseller, of course. And um, we'll have the link up in the chat section. For those of you who attend tonight and purchase Fiona's book, you have to, uh, the chance to win a gorgeous Hermes scarf. And of oh, course, we've all heard Fiona about that. <laughs> I would love to win this. I mean, the, the person at Penguin that had to go out and buy these Hermes scarves um, she was called up to answer for the credit card, uh, you know, the sudden spike on the credit card bill, because they're, they're really expensive. I would love to own an Hermes scarf. It's like one of those iconic um, wardrobe elements to own. So one of you lucky people are going to win an Hermes scarf tonight. Enjoy it. And you'll see why it's in the story when you read the story. And the I can just see that the details have been put up on the chat uh, line. And if you need more details, then go to the uh, Geelong Regional Libraries Corporation website, and that will also give the terms and conditions. So on behalf of Geelong Regional Libraries, thank you so much, obviously, Fiona, to our audience, to Geelong Libraries, and, um, and good evening. Night, night. <laughs>